find the inverse of a relation or function, all we have to do is switch the inputs with the outputs. Let's look at relation R. We see the domain and the range. And then all we do when we take the inverse, switch those. So now the range becomes the domain on the inverse and the domain becomes the range. Kind of a simple concept, but of course there's a lot more to learn about it. If we're given a function and we wanna take its inverse, remember that inverse may or may not be a function. We'll have to test it. We'll see it as we go along. Let's look at the first example. We have relation S. The first thing I wanna do is find the inverse of relation S. So I'm going to put down an XY chart and then what are we gonna do? We're going to switch, switch, inverse switch, the inputs and outputs or the X's and the Y's. Let's do it. So the inverse of S, all we did was switch the X's and Y's. So now for the inverse, I have the X values of negative one, zero, two, three. Let's go ahead and plot the points from relation S and then plot the points for the inverse. Use two different colors. I'm gonna use purple for my original and the yellow as my inverse. So the points in purple are from relation S and the points in yellow are from the inverse of relation S. I also plotted the line Y equals X because a relation and its inverse reflect about the line Y equals X. So it's another way we can graphically check if they're inverses. Let's emphasize again that in the original relation S, the domain were the X values, the range were the Y values, but then in the inverse, those swapped. So now the domain are the X values of negative one, zero, two, three, and the range are the Y values of zero, two, three, four. Well, let's keep this up. So looking at number two, determine the inverse of the function and state the domain and range. We got this. F of X equals two X plus six. All right, I'm gonna end up graphing this, stating its domain and range and all that good stuff. So before I even touch an inverse, let's do that. Let's graph F of X equals two X plus six. That's just slope intercept form. And then we'll state its domain and range. Oof, that was fast. Slope, intercept form, we got it. Intercept six, slopes two over one, got my line, and I know the domain and range are just all real numbers. Now, how do we find an inverse? If in the table, all we were doing was switching X and Y to find the inverse graph, I can do the same thing with a function. So let's call f of x y equals 2x plus 6. Well, if I want to find the inverse, I'm just going to swap x and y. Just switch them. So now I have x equals 2y plus 6. To find the inverse, I'm just going to solve for y. So y equals 1 half x minus 3. That's my inverse. Now, I was using a different color for my inverse, but this would be confusing. So we come up with a notation, f with this little negative one looking thing of x, that just means f inverse of x. That little negative one is not an exponent, f inverse of x. There is our inverse notation for functions. f inverse of x is one half x minus three. Let's get that plotted. Well, check it out. I've got my inverse plotted and it totally is a reflection of the original equation about that y equals x line. We've discovered something else here. These intersect on that line of symmetry as well at negative six, negative six. So a function and its inverse, if they intersect, are gonna intersect on that y equals x line. Let's verify some points and see if our x and y values truly did swap. On my original, I have the point zero six. Well, x and y switched, so that means I should have the point six zero on my inverse. Look at there, I totally do. This is cool. So the domain and range, I just swap them. So now my original function's domain would be my inverse's range and the range of my original would be the domain of my inverse. And look, it's totally true, all real numbers because we got a line for that inverse as well. Example three, f of x equals x squared minus one. Whoa, good thing I know that one. It's just a parabola that's been translated down one unit. Let's graph. From the vertex, over one, up one. From the vertex, over two, up four. So there's our parabola. Now we know to graph the inverse, I could take the five points that I have and just swap them x, y, and graph. But let's go ahead and algebraically find the inverse of this function. Remember how to do it? Let's switch x and y. Now we have to solve for y. x plus one equals y squared. I have to solve for y. 
I'm going to have to square root. Yikes, if I square root, what do I need? Two answers plus minus. So the inverse is positive negative square root of x plus one. So let's graph the positive square root of x plus one. Well, that's the square root function that's been translated to the left one unit. So my end point goes over one unit, but then my pattern points stay the same. To the right one, up one, to the back to the end point, to the right four, up two. Next, the negative square root of x plus one. Same thing, translated to the left one unit, but now it's been reflected as well. Let's talk domain and range. The original function is a parabola. And I said function, is it a function? Yeah, it passes the vertical line test. Well, on a parabola, the domain is all real numbers. Anywhere on the x-axis, I can walk along, look up. I might have to look way up, but there's part of the graph. So if I know the domain of the original, then I know the range of the inverse. So without even thinking, I can go ahead and write for the range, it is going to be all real numbers, or negative infinity to infinity. So let's go back to the original function and talk about the range. If I walk along the y-axis, the first number I come to is negative one. And then as I continue to walk, I see the graph in both directions. So it continues on forever. So my range will be negative one inclusive to infinity, or we can say y is greater than or equal to negative one. And then remember, if we know the range of the original, we know the domain of the inverse. So for our domain, once again, negative one inclusive to infinity, or in inequality form, x is greater than or equal to negative one. Now the last thing is we haven't dealt with, is our inverse a function? Remember I said they are not always functions. So the original is a function, but does the inverse pass the vertical line test? No, it does not. So my inverse is not a function. The next example is the square root of x and then plus two. So we have our square root function that's been translated up two units. Let's go ahead and work through this entire function. Hope you remembered the pattern points from the endpoint over one up one, from the endpoint over four up two. Then what is my domain? What is my range? Well, I see if I'm walking along that x axis, the first time I see the graph is when x is zero and then it goes on from there. So the domain is going to be zero to infinity or x is greater than or equal to zero. And then the range, when do I see that y value? Walking up the y axis as soon as I get to two. So remember that that correlates to that endpoint value. Do I need to graph the inverse to know the domain and range of the inverse? No, let's go ahead and fill that out right now. Remember, if you're writing it in inequality form, you have to change the x's and y's. So you don't, we're marking it wrong. Now we're ready to algebraically find the inverse. So I'll switch the x and y and then solve for y. Go for it. We get a parabola, awesome. Well, it's been translated, it's a parabola that's been translated to the right two units. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Go to the right two units and then remember our pattern points from the vertex over one up one, from the vertex over two up four. Wait a second, this parabola doesn't look like the inverse function. It doesn't reflect over that line y equals x. Well, part of it does, what's going on here? Oh yeah, go back to the domain of the inverse. The domain of the inverse is x is greater than or equal to two. So it is the inverse, but it only applies for x is greater than or equal to two. So we only need one half of the function. So you might wanna use dash to kind of show that section, but it's not part of the inverse function. It is only the portion that is x greater than or equal to two. That looks better. Definitely reflected over y equals x, and they intersect on y equals x. And they're both functions. Wow, I kind of think you're getting the hang of this. So basically, we graph the original function, find its domain and range, swap those so that we have our inverse's domain and range, we find our inverse function, and then graph that. Not too bad. Why don't you try that on five and six? Pause. Let's check five. First, we graph our parabola, x plus three squared, and then find the domain and range. We can switch those so that we have the domain and range of our inverse, and that's gonna help us when we graph our inverse. Then, to find the inverse algebraically, we switched x and y, solved for y, and I got an inverse of plus or minus square root x minus three. Is that inverse a function? No, nope. doesn't pass that vertical line test. 
So when we start as a parabola, the inverse is not a function. Makes sense, because we're reflecting about that y equals x line. Checking six. Of course, we graphed that radical equation first, and then we found its domain and range, swapped those so we had the domain and range of our inverse. Extra important here. Then algebraically, going after my inverse, switching that x and y, and ending up with x squared plus one. Why was it so important that I found the domain and range of my inverse before graphing? I got this parabola, and if I compare it to my original, those don't look like inverses of each other. It's not a reflection about that y equals x line. What did I do wrong? My domain for my inverse is only true from zero to infinity. So I'm gonna dash that left side of the parabola because it's not really there. Is my inverse a function? Yeah. So when I start with the square root, my inverse is a function. In this next section, we're asked if f of x and g of x are inverses of each other. Well, a quick way to do that is compositions of functions. If we take f of g of x and we get x, and then we take g of f of x and we get x, they're inverses of each other. Let's try one. Let's do f of g of x. So I'm gonna plug in g of x to x. So for this first one, f of g of x is three times x plus five divided by three minus five. Well, those threes divide out, leaving me with x plus five minus five. Oh, look at that, I get x. Ooh, that's a good start. So now we wanna check if g of f of x is also x. g of f of x is three x minus five plus five all divided by three. Okay, so that's 3x divided by 3. Oh, I get x. So f and g are inverses of each other. All right, let's try it again. Number eight, go ahead and do f of g of x. f of g of x equals x minus 5. Darn, doesn't equal x. So no, th these aren't going to be inverses of each other. As soon as we get a fail and it doesn't equal x, we can stop and say no. Try the last one. You got this. Woo! f of x and g of x are inverses in number nine. 